me sound from the belly. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, I can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me start my talk. Okay, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting me for this nice workshop. And today I'm gonna talk about the uh, gravitational ranging in gravitational waves. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, probably some of you already know about this topic, but uh, I would briefly introduce what gravitational lensing and gravitational waves. So, uh, as we know very well from the electromagnetic wave observations, uh, uh, the lights uh, passing nearby the massive object. Uh, can be bent by the uh, gravitational potential. So like uh, similar to the light, uh, gravitational waves can be lensed uh, when they propagate near a massive object. So um, following the same analogy of the gravitational lensing of the light, uh, we can imagine the all possible lensing signatures like the strong, weak, and micro lensing are possible. Uh, those lensing characteristics uh, depend on the lensing configuration, uh, such as the alignment between observer lens and source, uh, or the lens mass. Uh, so we expect to detect uh, the multiple magnified or the magnified gravitational signals at different time if the uh, gravitational signal is strongly lensed, or the we may detect the weakly magnified single gravitational wave signal uh, if the signal is uh, weak lensed. Or uh, we also, uh, we are also possible to detect the gravitational signal superposed with the uh, less than one second time delays between multiple images if the uh, signal is the micro lens. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the gravitational lensing will make us to detect more gravitational waves from much farther sources beyond the detection limit of the detector sensitivities because the, uh, it typically the gravitational lensing uh, magnify or uh, amplify the, the faint sources. So uh, we expect like that. And then uh, more such kind of more detections will be beneficial in enriching our knowledge on both astrophysical or cosmological phenomena. So, uh, so far, uh, there have been several efforts to find the lensing signatures from the gravitational events observed during the three observing runs. Uh, the Professor Hyung Mo Lee uh, summarized in this morning. But uh, unfortunately, there is no widely accepted compelling evidence uh, was found. Uh, for example, uh, the, there was the two compre comprehensive searches by the every K collaboration, and the detection criteria was uh, the base factor testing the lensing hypothesis to against to the online hypothesis. And the target was the signatures of the strong lensing and micro lensing. And there was no search for weak lens signatures because the some uh, technical issue. And these two snapshots are the papers of the two papers. And even though there was no uh, detection yet, uh, some studies suggested that uh, the expected de uh, detection rate for the future of the observing loss uh, will avail uh, available, we will be available to uh, detect such kind of the land gravitational waves. For example, uh, order of one events per year for a strongly land gravitational wave, if the uh, current ground-based detectors like the LIGO, VIGO, and CAGRA uh, reach their design sensitivities and the sources at the about the ledge shift one, or for the micro uh, gravitational signals, uh, similar rate is forecasted 
uh, order of one events per year uh, under certain circumstances. circumstances. Uh, for example, the source is pressed between the redshift two and three, and the uh, magnification, the amount of mag magnification is about the theory. Okay, uh, let me move on to the uh, specific uh, lensing signatures, what I have done recent three years. Uh, first one is the about the strong lensing. Uh, typically, the strong lensing can be occurred by the galaxies or galaxy clusters. Uh, it means the, the much larger, high, heavier mass uh, is the typical source or lens systems causing the strong lensing. And the strong lensing, uh, if the lens uh, any signal, either gravitational wave or the electromagnetic wave, is the lens by a strongly lensed, then the Strong lensing can produce the multiple images, uh, at least two and more than two images on the lens plane, as shown in the this, uh, schematic figure. And then uh, strongly lensed gravitational from the position of images on the lens plane uh, may arrive at the gravitational detector network, the Earth, uh, with a certain time delays uh, from days to months. Days. So, uh, Related to the strong ranging of gravitational wave, uh, we have studied the uh, how much uh, improvement on the distance estimation to the source could be achieved uh, utilizing, the, uh, utilizing the strong ranging phenomena. So for this work, we suppose that uh, for simplicity, uh, a point mass lens or a singular isosomal sphere lens of the Redshift lens mass is 10 to the 11.5 solar mass, might produce the two lens gravitational images for a the UW15 or 914 like signal. And then we also suppose that both lens gravitational waves are detected by the LIGO Virgo network. And then we uh, assume the detecting all lens gravitational waves may have to enhance the estimation on the distance to the sources. So for this study, uh, we conducted the parameter estimation for the luminous distance to the origin source using two apparent uh, luminous distance to the uh, images on the lens plane. Uh, then uh, by inferring the relative magnification divided like this, the mu plus minus means the Magnification uh, vector of those two uh, lens signals, and this relation is also can be represented by this apparent luminous distance to the, those two images. Uh, for your information, the for the depending on the lens model, uh, like the point mass or SIS, those the magnification vector mu plus mass can be. Uh, represent in this closed form. So let me show you the result. Uh, here is the posterior, so those the two apparent uh, luminous distance and the, the original luminous distance to the source. Uh, so first result is showing the posterior, so those apparent distances uh, for the length to lens this uh, gravitational signals. And then those the leftmost panels uh, showing the posterior of so the mu, re, mu relative, uh, relative mu, uh, relative magnification factor. And our uh, parameter estimation correctly infer the uh, true value. And also for the uh, Term mass of those the system or those images, uh, the the inference or parameter estimation also could uh, correctly estimate the value. Sorry, and the finally uh, for the apparent luminous distance to those two images, our inference show that uh, the true value uh, to those uh, to the those uh, two images as there is some shifted from the true value uh, shown in the solid line. 
but uh, it can be included within the 99% uh, credible interval. And using those information, we eventually uh, estimate the luminosity distance to the source, original source. Uh, and we tested uh, those the estimation in different noises and or the network configuration. And for this uh, posterior figure, uh, we summarize the width of the computer's intervals. Uh, the top table show the 99% uh, credible interval and the 67% uh, credible interval uh, with the zero noise model. Uh, for your information, the zero noise model means the there's no fluctuations in the uh, sensitivity curve, uh, and there's only a very clean the PSD line uh, design sensitive uh, line of the design sensitivity design sensitivities of the detectors. And then uh, we could see that uh, with the zero noise model, uh, using the lens signal, uh, the width of the uh, credit rate interval can be enhanced about a few tens of the tens of percent. And for the other noise model, uh, the uh, Austria A noise PSDs, uh, we could see less amount of improvement compared to the zero noise model, but it's quite natural because the, the kind of noise fluctuation hinders the clear identification of those the signal. And then even though uh, the improvement on the width estimation is still a few tenths of percent. So uh, we concluded that uh, utilizing the strongly lens signal uh, is beneficial in more accurate or enhanced uh, estimation for the luminous distance to the source. So let me move on to the micro lensing related work. Uh, First, the micro-ranging of gravitational wave can be caused by stellar mass object, uh, smaller than 10 to the 5 solar mass, uh, covering the uh, stellar mass black holes, not only the stellar mass black holes, but also the intermediate mass black holes. Uh, and then that uh, can be happened by that mass of the stellar mass object embedded around the macro lenses like the galaxies or galaxy clusters. And then uh, the micro and gravitational waves can uh, may arrive at detectors with the order of one to hundred milliseconds of time delay between the multiple lens signal, and that amount of time delay makes the superposition of those signals, and then it uh, results in and the interference pattern, also known as the beating pattern, as shown in this left figure. And then when we convert this uh, time series data to the uh, time frequency to the major image play, then we can see this kind of the a typical pattern of the micro lens signal. So uh, if we regard the two uh, lens images by the micro lensing system, then because of the time delay, there's uh, two peaks uh, at the merger of the Gravitational signal, and then we can see there's the beating patterns or nodes on the uh, inspire phase. So, uh, but many people already know that if the binary system uh, process by the misalignment between the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum, then that uh, the kind of the processing binary system can produce the uh, oscillating or modulating waveforms as shown in the uh, second top panel. And when we uh, simulated the micro and the signal, uh, the third top panel here, uh, those two signals very look similar to each other. 
So those kind of the morphological similarity between those the micro lens gravitational wave and, and gravitational wave from Christian and binaries um, raise a fundamental question. Can we discern micro lens gravitational wave from uh, precessing gravitational waves? But so uh, without any noise, um, uh, we can distinguish uh, them probably with these uh, two peaks uh, around the merger time. But sorry, uh, if the, we assume the presence of noise, uh, like the shown in this uh, middle low, then it's very hard to distinguish or recognize the double peaks characteristic of the microwave signal and all the uh, wave modulation caused by the processing system. And we also yeah, can see um, those significant difference from those the time frequency image map as shown in the bottom row. So uh, this kind of the uh, apparent signature uh, makes us to study uh, how we can distinguish those signals. So let me show you the result. The first one is the signal to noise ratio based test. Uh, we computed the matched filter signal to noise ratios with four different hypotheses uh, for the temporal waveform. Uh, so we tested the four cases uh, whether the signal is the unlensed or the micro lens, and whether the system. The binary system is the non precessing system or the precessing system. So, uh, we for the computation of the SNR, um, we make the two type of pairs. First one is a homogeneous pair, which means the same non processing or precessing source for both template or target. And then the heterogeneous pairs uh, standing the opposite source types is uh, assumed. And then uh, Comparing those SNRs of different templates for a given target uh, enables us to distinguish the gravitational wave of interest. So, for example, uh, for the L, the micro lens and non precessing target, the SNR of the using the, the same non precessing uh, micro lens target uh, template uh, resulting in the, the highest SNR value against to the other type of template. And also for the processing and online uh, target signal using the uh, processing and online uh, template uh, resulting the highest SNR. And also for the uh, processing and lens, the micro lens target signal uh, using the processing and micro lens uh, template uh, rejecting the highest external value than other template cases. So the result uh, implies that we have to repeat computing SNRs with uh, regarding all possible hypotheses, even for a single target. It means uh, we, if we regard this kind of four type of hypothesis, then we have to repeat the computation of SNR four times. So is maybe disadvantageous uh, for practical analysis, increasing in the sense of the computation time. And anyway, uh, it suggests that a complete template bank considering all possible hypotheses required for the uh, standard template-based gravity research method or pipeline uh, to distinguish uh, whether the signal is micro length or or from this processing system. We also tested uh, the parameter estimation based uh, distinguish, distinction amount. And so for this test, we only focused on the uh, non processing micro lens and processing micro lens signal, commonly showing the waveform modulation or inter interference pattern or the double peaks. Uh, we for this test, uh, we infer the four selected parameters of injected simulated signals. Uh, here are the four, four parameters, number of the lens signal, 
the true value is the two and effective luminous distance of the second signal, the true value is uh, 1.2 gigaparsec and the time delay between the two LED signal, the, the true value is uh, about uh, 58 millisecond. And the final one is the dimensionless effective precision spin. Uh, the value chi p is about the 0.76 for the uh, processing microlens signal. Uh, for comparison, uh, the chi p becomes zero for the non processing microlens signal. So here is the result, result uh, posteriors. And the, we can see that the posteriors T3 is very well around the true values. And our P could uh, properly estimate the true values. So uh, we found that recovering K, the number, number of the lens signal makes us to focus on the hypothesis only related to the precision effect. Uh, it's, uh, it means that we only need to test two hypotheses uh, is uh, beneficial than the SNR-based test. And then we also uh, found that the precision effect doesn't affect the identifying microlens events. And also, uh, we tried to search the microlens cryptic events uh, with deep learning because the, the every K collaboration uh, searches the kind of uh, such kind of events based on the beta factor. So uh, using this uh, the time frequency image, uh, we tried to uh, search the microlens signature from the uh, the same 46 BBS events uh, studied or searched by the AVK collaboration in the previous works. And then, uh, so for the simulation of the training sample, uh, we assume the micro ranging of the gravitational wave occur with the lens masses of between the 10 to 3 or 10 to 5 solar mass. And then we assume the lens model as the point mass lens model in geometric optics limit uh, and to mimic the real, realistic uh, situation, the presence of noise, uh, we impose the power spectral density of the light, advanced LIGO's design sensitivity. And then we design this kind of the hierarchical classification scheme. For, so using the output of the uh, deep learning prediction, uh, then we classify them into the, uh, the temporary classification based on the probability estimated by the deep learning model. And then collecting those informations, uh, we classify the events into the primary class and then using the p-value for the median probability for each event, uh, we get the final class of each event. So here is a result. And among those uh, 46 events, uh, we found that only one event uh, is classified in the uh, lens event from the uh, primary class. But uh, for this event, when we look at the details of the, this event, uh, the median probability was very high enough with the 90% credible interval estimated from the bootstrapping. But for this uh, median probability, we obtained the p-value is placed in this rather wider range. But uh, as we know, from the statistics that the uh, uncertainty of the p-value includes the possibility of the unlanded hypothesis being true. It means the p, it contains p is bigger than 0 0.05. And also from the every case study or every case search, the beta factor for this event was uh, minus 0 0.4, uh, which is favoring land hypothesis. And also, when we uh, plot the, the medium 
probability and the p-value distribution, uh, this event is uh, covering also in including this uh, unlinked hypothesis through where the, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, over here where the unlinked hypothesis is being true. And when you also look at the uh, time frequency images of this event, uh, we couldn't see no visually recognize of the signature of bidding patterns from those the LIGO hand and LIGO resistance data. Uh, for your, your information, uh, for this event, uh, video didn't uh, detect the signal. So let me summarize my talk. Uh, as the light being gravitational lens, uh, expecting gravitational lensing, gravitational wave is also possible by the same analogy. And there has been no widely accepted compelling evidence of lens signature and observed gravitational wave yet, but it is still promising to detect lens gravitational wave based on the forecast of detection rate. And so once we observe the lens gravitational wave, uh, those signals will help us to understand diverse astrophysical or cosmological phenomena much deeper. For example, uh, if we detect the strongly lensed signal, then it will enable us to precisely estimate the distance to gravitational resources, uh, reducing the, uh, the statistical uncertainties for the estimation, and it will have a correct measurement of the Hubble constant uh, using this Hubble flow, and that kind of the enhancement may reserve the Hubble tension. And on the other hand, if uh, we detect micro lens gravitational signal, uh, it will provide more detailed information about the stellar object embedded in galaxies, and it will also help to find dark complex object like the dark matter or the isolated molecular systems. So I believe that. The gravitational lensing of gravitational waves will boost multi messenger astronomy together with the EM lensing event. Okay, thank you for your attention. I can hear anything from the venue or Jim. Now, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. So, any, uh, any question or comment? So what, so what are the data using? Are using? So when do you expect that uh, we will confirm the gravitational lensing from gravitational wind by combining the future observation and your techniques like machine learning? For example, within 10 years or <laughs> well, yeah, it's very uh, good question. Well, uh, I hope so, yeah, within 10 or less than 10 years. <laughs> but but anyway, the, uh, as I mentioned, the forecast on the detection rate uh, is the lens, gravitational lensing of gravitational waves is very rare, uh, one event per year. Uh, is very rare than the typical detection rate on the any gravitational signal events. Uh, it is expected, for example, one event per day uh, for the first observing runs. But yes, even though you know the the rather rare probabilities or rather rare chance to detect the kind of the lens decryption waves. Uh, we expect that the even uh, the next generation gravitational detector like the uh, Einstein telescope or Cosmic Explorer will uh, 
start the, their observing runs, then probably it will increase definitely, yes, increase the detection chance. Uh, yeah, with these enhanced sensitivities. Thank you very much for your kind information. Uh, so now we. So, Professor Dong Sam, please ask question. Can you hear me, Professor Dong Sam? Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, if the time allows. Okay. Okay. I, I cannot hear what uh, Kimiko is saying here, but uh, let me just uh, continue. Uh, you mentioned the possible candidate for the alleged uh, gravitational wave event in page 13 or 8. Would you show that? Here. Oh, yeah, yeah, there, certain. Yeah. Yes. So this uh, GW uh, 19 or 7 or 8, uh, oh, seven this is seven. single. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, we probably expect uh, the if the distance is quite large or long distance, then probably the uh, nearby events might be the, the uh, land event. So what about uh, you checked the uh, other uh, events around this, uh, this, this event? Uh. Um, well, I haven't checked the, any uh, other observ observables like the luminous distance to the each source of the each event. But uh, anyway, the range phenomena depends on the uh, the range configuration. I mean the mm -hmm. the align the alignment between the let the original source and range system and observer is very crucial for occurring the kind of range phenomena. So uh, if uh, there's no known mass di distribution within the uh, sky localization of the each event. Uh, probably it may be hard to expect the range the signals uh, would be detected. That's okay, another, then, yeah, another criterion, yes. Okay, then what about this uh, uh, 1907 and 07 or 06? They are quite close in time. Yes. So their mass configurations and also the distances are quite different from this uh, yellow one? Yes, uh, I remember so. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So probably it's not the landed counterpart, landed image. But All right. uh, yeah. anyway, yeah, I would like to emphasize that for this search, we didn't regard any uh, physical observables for each event. We only focus on the weather, the Expected microlensing signature uh, uh, shown in these these uh, images or not? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, on on a single image. Yes. Not not considered the correlations. Yeah, no events. Okay. Yeah, no correlations. Yes. Due to due to lens. But okay. we check the coincidence between different data like this, the LIGO Hempro data and LIGO Livingston data. Only for the uh, sing, same uh, the single same event. event. Yeah, the okay. same single event, yes. Uh, not different events. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind information. Uh, so let's move on to the next speaker. Let's thank the Dr. Chumin Kim again. Thank you. So next speaker is Dr. Shintaro Aoi.
All right, can you hear me? Can you hear me good? So now, can you hear me, right? Okay, so before the read, so next figure is the third screen double RP, not to one university. Who can you include me at this line and what Monica can you? If I think I'll do it. Thanks for introduction. Uh, I'm Shantaraoji. Uh, I'm a postdoc in Chua University. So uh, thank you for coming our workshop and I hope uh, you are enjoying the discussion and the conversation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my recent work uh, on the cosmological collider topic. Uh, as uh, uh, Daniel Green explained well about the uh, non gaussianity this morning, uh, this is, uh, I think this is uh, uh, recently one of the most uh, uh, interesting topic uh, in the uh, non gaussianity So if you get the interest, uh, uh, please take a look at my paper. So uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, for the inflation observable, uh, we uh, focused on the normally two point correlation function. Uh, during inflation, uh, some uh, curvature perturbation appears, and uh, what we observe is, uh, for example, uh, yeah, I denote the curvature perturbation by zeta, and we are interested in the uh, two point relation function of zeta. And we also have a gravitational tensor mode, and uh, yeah, we also uh, observed, uh, we haven't observed yet that uh, uh, our interest is also two point relation function of the tensor mode gamma. And sometimes, uh, uh, we can uh, calculate the uh, shift of the uh, correlation function. And so that is called the uh, spectral index NF defined by this equation. And in principle, you can define shield of shield and shield of shield to shield. And uh, this is uh, uh, maybe you know very well for the uh, 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 inflation based on the uh, uh, particle physics model building. So as you know very well, uh, the spectral index defined by this equation can be related um, by the information of the uh, derivative of the infrared potential in this way. Uh, here V prime is the first derivative and V prime prime is the second derivative. And also you can define the tensor to scalar ratio. This is a ratio uh, between the power spectrum of the uh, tensor uh, perturbation divided by the uh, power spectrum of the curvature perturbation. And it turns out it also, uh, again, can be rewritten as the uh, derivative of the potential. And uh, uh, the current observation constraint to these two variables uh, strongly. And the, uh, as you know very well, uh, some of the uh, chaotic type of inflation uh, are already ruled out by the uh, 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 favorite, uh, from the favorite body of the spectral shield and the tensor to scalar ratio. So uh, of course you can consider a uh, higher, more, much more higher uh, point correlation function beyond the two point correlation function. Uh, for example, uh, three point correlation function the curvature perturbation is called by spectrum. And you can consider also four point correlation function called the solid spectrum. And this is also true for the uh, tensor perturbation. So this is, uh, how to say, this kind of higher point correlation function that is called the non-Gaussianity is uh, uh, my topic. So uh, more uh, concretely, the, this kind of, for example, just to suppose, uh, just to focus on the three-point correlation function, and uh, this kind of three-point correlation function uh, can be produced by some interaction of the uh, self-interaction of the uh, curvature perturbation. So this is a time direction in the very early universe uh, from the uh, uh, three-point interaction, it, uh, curvature perturbation is produced and it leaves an imprint on the CMB surface. Uh, that is the, uh, how to say, a way to visualize uh, the physics. And uh, actually by the famous work of the Marda Sena, uh, we know the non-gaussian parameter, just this is, FNL is roughly 
speaking is related to the magnitude of the three-point correlation function. But it, you, you can show uh, this is very small. The magnitude is or the epsilon, epsilon is a smaller parameter, so it's really small. And uh, it is small for the simple model. That is uh, what Madhavakana shows in his famous paper. And by simple, I mean, I assume the uh, single inflaton, single scalar field uh, plus Einstein gravity. I don't consider any modified gravity uh, with the canonical kinetic term for the inflaton. And uh, uh, it's not, you, you cannot see, but it's, uh, we, I assume, Floral inflation also. So by using, uh, by ba based on this kind of condition, we, you can generically show that Don Gaussian parameter is uh, really small. And also, but sometimes you can get the large Don Gaussianity for more, more general situation. If you break this kind of uh, condition or assumption, you, you can have a possibility to get the large Don Gaussianity. For example, if you consider large field inflation or higher derivative terms of the inflaton, like a DBI inflation, then you have a possibility to get the large number of shanty. So uh, this is observation and constraint. I realize this is not the latest one. I'm sorry for that. So, but uh, uh, what we do uh, to compare the, uh, the theory to the observation, uh, we prepare several types of the template, uh, which capture the, some uh, specific shape and uh, we get uh, uh, some observational constraint for the, uh, each template. So you can see uh, for the simple model, the longevity is really small, but not for the uh, more general uh, inflation model. And we have a kind of stringent constraint and maybe in the future more. Then I can say again, uh, longevity <coughs> Uh, have a strong restriction on the inflation model like a two-point correlation function. So, <clears throat> so that is first uh, point what uh, I want to say. And uh, my topic uh, is more actually, uh, recently uh, people are uh, interested in the so-called cosmological collider program, uh, which I will uh, discuss in the next slide. Okay. So, uh, now, uh, so far I focused on the uh, self-interaction of the curvature perturbation, but uh, you can have this kind of diagram in the early universe, uh, new particle, sigma particle uh, created and uh, it decayed to the uh, curvature perturbation. Actually, it turns out uh, uh, if this kind of process really occur, then you can get uh, a non-trivial uh, observational consequence on the non gaussianity uh, more specifically, in this case, Nongashanti can contain the information of the heavy particle, which may be uh, possibly a new particle. Uh, here I denote sigma with specific oscillation signal. So uh, in the momentum space, uh, in the, uh, as I will, I will show you later, but uh, in the momentum space, uh, this kind of uh, Nongashanti has a specific momentum dependence. Uh, which is characterized by the uh, oscillation. And also uh, the uh, detectable particle, the mass of the detectable particle can be uh, hyperscaled during inflation. Of course, this value depends on the inflation models, but it can be as large as 10 to 13 GB at the most. So this scale is much, much higher than the uh, energy scale of the terrestrial experiment. That's why we can, we may be able to search the very, very high energy physics based on uh, this kind of discussion. So again, I, I said uh, the non gaussianity from the cell interaction, uh, if you assume the simple model, it's really small. That is what I said. But uh, depending on the diagram, this can be, uh, this kind of diagram can give the large signal, unlike the uh, cell interaction. So we may uh, uh, detect, uh, uh, we may expect a large signal. Uh, of course, it depends on the interaction. So uh, let me go on more detail. Uh, this is an exam example of the scalar phase sigma uh, in the intermediate step. So this is uh, the same diagram uh, on the uh, three-point correlation function. So, uh, so we have three momentum, K1, so this is K2, K1, K2, K3. 
and you can take a specific uh, configuration of the momentum uh, that is uh, uh, called squeeze ring. Uh, that is the one of the momentum is much, much, much smaller than the, the other. Uh, in this uh, squeeze limit, we get the kind of uh, uh, sharp signal. And uh, this F, F is roughly SNL. Uh, it's uh, up to the some three factor. So it, which is proportional to the three point correlation function, the curvature perturbation. And it turns out uh, the this F can be expressed by in this way. So here C is a mass dependent uh, correction. And the important point is the momentum dependent here. So you can see this is the two I times mu. Mu is roughly speaking the mass of the sigma particle. So, so this uh, three point correlation function has the oscillation. And the important point is that this oscillation is characterized by the uh, um, frequency determined by the uh, mu, part, mu particle mass. So we can say, we can read off the mass of a mu particle sigma from this oscillation frequency. Uh, many works so far. Uh, yeah, there are, uh, yeah, people try to find a new physics based on the non rationality for example, supersymmetry, or yeah, they, the Japanese uh, people uh, discuss more general interaction based on the ESP approach. And uh, yeah, Hayasin also discussed. And uh, in order to find a new particle being the standard model back particle background, and they are that such background is discussed by these guys. And also left to genesis and the gut uh, application to the gut uh, recently discussed. And also as uh, Daniel also mentioned, uh, recently uh, one of the uh, uh, hot direction is a uh, boot, bootstrapping approach. So actually, yeah, we need to compute the non rationality but it's really complicated because of the time integration. Uh, because the coupling, the inflation calculation, the coupling constant is, has time dependent. And we need to perform the time integration, uh, which is really uh, difficult. But uh, in the boost strapping approach, uh, we rely on the uh, fundamental principle like a unitarity or unitarity. Uh, then uh, uh, we can, how to say, uh, directly uh, get the final result. So uh, uh, it's not related to my topic, either, but just uh, uh, I show here. So uh, from now on, I wanna move to my uh, work. So we asked this kind of questions. Yeah, so far there are many works, but they most of them focus on the single particle with different mass and spin. So uh, our question is, what about multiple particle case? Uh, you may you might think this is a, a kind of trivial uh, extension, but I think it's uh, very important uh, because uh, uh, this kind of uh, multiple uh, state is really natural from the uh, point of uh, model building. So, uh, for example. Uh, if you consider supersymmetric theory, so during the inflation, uh, yeah, we, we need a inflaton potential. So that the inflaton potential breaks the supersymmetry, and uh, the the so we get the soft mass for the uh, stand, standard and the, uh, supersymmetric particle, and uh, the supersymmetry breaking order parameter is roughly given by the half scale during the inflation. So. In that sense, the uh, several uh, matter fields acquire the soft mass, uh, which is roughly given by, by the Hubble scale. So the situation is like this. The inflaton is only light mode, and there are several heavy particles whose mass is around the Hubble scale. This is uh, the situation uh, I'm interested in. So uh, we uh, discussed the multi-field effect on, on the cosmological collider. The first sentence is a kind of trivia. Uh, yeah, even if there are many particles, uh, uh, whole signal is governed by the light, lightest particle due to the Boltzmann suppression factor. So yeah, actually because of this factor, the heavy mode do not affect, uh, he heavy means compared to the Hubble scale, if M is large, this factor suppresses the signal, so heavy mode do not affect. 
But what we, we found is the non-trivial signal appear for the almost degenerate case. Actually, this is not the, uh, today's topic, but I only showed some results. Uh, we consider this kind of diagram. Uh, yeah, uh, we discuss multi field at the level of the tree and loop level. And here, sigma has a index i, uh, which can be arbitrary. And we get, uh, I, I do not explain detail, but we get a uh, very non trivial specific signal by the superposition of the uh, several degenerate particles. Uh, one of the interesting thing is the, uh, at the loop calculation, we found the, the total wavelength is uh, characterized by the uh, wavelength, which is inversely proportional to the mass difference. So you see, you of course, the mass difference is, is the notion for the March uh, particle space. So if you find this kind of signal, that means the uh, uh, existence of the March field uh, uh, whose mass are around the half the space. Uh, maybe this one. Okay, so today uh, I want to focus on the uh, more uh, interesting situation. Uh, so the next question is what about a continuous spectrum? Actually, this kind of continuous spectrum is motivated by the some extra dimensional model like uh, dot work or linear Dirichlet theory. So the, uh, as I said, oh, this is a discrete case that is a usual situation. As I said, uh, even if there are many particles, many heavy particles, this lightest particle uh, uh, determine the whole signal. But uh, uh, my question is what about the continuous uh, situation? In the continuous situation, maybe, uh, how to say, the, these regions uh, maybe collectively affect the uh, signal and then we may get a non-trivial uh, signal. So uh, this is a setup. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we don't have to specify the setup and uh, we can uh, generalize the discussion, but for concreteness, I consider this kind of setup. Uh, here, uh, the phi is infraton and the sigma is a uh, uh, heavy particle with continuous spectrum. And so coupling uh, appears through the, uh, this F, F function, F depends on sigma and uh, uh, it's coupled to the kinetic term of the infraton which produces interaction interaction. So uh, as usual, uh, we uh, solve the background equation and they consider the fluctuation around the background. And then, uh, yeah, infraton is uh, quantized by the usual mode function. Uh, so here U is the solution of the mode function of the uh, massless anti-Newton motion. And here sigma, uh, sigma is the, uh, our particle with continuous spectrum. So here B is a mod solution of the mode function for the massive uh, scalar. But I, now I want to consider continuous case. So I inserted, I implemented the continuousness by inserting this kind of uh, uh, spectral density. So here rho m square uh, is roughly describing how the continuous spectrum is distri distributed as a function of mass. Uh, interaction, uh, you can find uh, this kind of two point interaction, it's kind of a transfer vertex, and they also get uh, this kind of three point uh, interaction. Actually, I, I, I should stress uh, these uh, two interaction does not do not necessarily give the dominant contribution, but uh, uh, this is a really simple and you can get uh, a fully analytical expression. That's why I choose this kind of interaction. So these two interactions, you can uh, draw this kind of diagram. So uh, yeah, curvature perturbation is related to the infraton fluctuation in this, uh, by this relation as usual. And uh, yeah, the calculation is uh, straightforward. Just uh, uh, calculate the three point correlation fun function with the interaction in the previous slide uh, yeah, by using the uh, so-called the Schindler series formalism. And this is the definition of the shape function. Then uh, I will show you uh, only the result. So uh, of course, uh, it's really hard to uh, get the fully analytical expression in the general momentum configuration. 
but in the squeeze limit, the K1 over K3 is much larger than one, we get uh, this kind of uh, expression. Actually, uh, this yellow part is a new, this uh, contains the integration of the mass spectrum. And the other part, yeah, uh, this is just a free factor, and a kappa is a momentum, momentum ratio defined in this way. And you can see some oscillation signal, the frequency uh, is fixed by the mass of the uh, sigma particle. This is a normal rate. But uh, because of uh, this integration factor, we sum up somehow uh, this uh, uh, tower state by using uh, by this kind of integration. This is a new expression. And uh, I choose the simple diagram. So these complicated coefficient are completely fixed uh, in this way. OK. Uh, I don't need a sample factor, so I, I normalize the shape function by uh, introducing the F function, and uh, this can be rewritten in this way. So here is some complicated factor, but uh, again, this yellow part is a new uh, contribution coming from the continuous spectrum. So uh, just to compare this continuous one to the normal one, uh, I show this uh, single particle with a definite mass. Okay, uh, this is the final slide. Uh, for concreteness, yeah, of course, we need to perform the mass integration. I choose the specific spectral density, which is given by this form. And uh, actually, recently, this kind of uh, spectral density uh, has been discussed in the dark matter context by these authors. And I also choose the same one. And uh, this is the result. Uh, these two are just the differences uh, of mass parameter. But the, in both figure, you can see uh, this red one that is a continuous case, conti continuous spectrum case, has a damping effect. This gray line is a normal uh, discrete situation, and this red one is a continuous situation. You can see the continuous situation has a, a damping amplitude. And so I conclude if you could find this kind of damping effect, uh, we may say this is a kind of a signal of a continuous spectrum. And also I choose the, uh, a specific form, but the, the origin of the, this damping factor is coming from the, from the integration of the, some oscillation function. So maybe I'm expecting uh, for the other choice, uh, this kind of uh, damping, uh, damping uh, effect uh, appear as a consequence of the integration. So this is summary, maybe no time, right? Uh, you still have three minutes. Okay. Uh, as I say, the cosmological quiet is uh, a new, <laughs> okay, thank you. new attractive tool for explaining uh, high energy physics. And uh, I didn't show you detail, but much field signature on, uh, on cosmological collider uh, has been studied, uh, uh, motivated by the uh, supergravity embedding. And we found some non-trivial superposition for the almost degenerate cases. And it, yeah, today I also consider the continuous spectrum and the cosmological collider. Uh, this kind of a spectrum is motivated by extra-dimensional models. And uh, what we found is the damping effect in the deep squeeze limit. So what I want to stress is that this kind of signal cannot be mimicked by the single particle with a definite mass. So uh, this can uh, give a strong evidence of multi particles or continuous spectrum. Uh, I haven't yet studied in detail, but I think it's interesting to think uh, more about embedding into a concrete UV setup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shuntaro. Now it's open to question and comment. Are there any question or comment? Ah, okay, Sonsi. Yeah, if you start from the five dimension, 
in some concrete model, you can exactly get a, a continuous uh, spectrum. But, but of course, you can also consider some discretization setup of that. Then uh, you can take some limit. Uh, you, you can also realize this kind of continuous situation. Yeah, so it depends on the model, uh, which I wanna study more. Any, um, any other questions? Ah, okay, do you Very nice talk. So uh, I'm wondering, you said that the damping effect really doesn't depend on the mass spectrum, like how the, the continuous mass, the shape of the continuous mass spectrum. So, which means that once we dis have a, like a, if we measure a damping effect in the squeeze limit, we don't, so we cannot extract out how exactly the spectrum will be, only we know that it is a continuous. Uh, is there any, is there really no dependence in the, in the Actually, form? I haven't checked yet uh, uh, in detail for the other choices, mm -hmm. but I think, uh, yeah, maybe I should check that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, actually the, this kind of, yeah, the fact that this uh, amplitude dump Mm -hmm. uh, maybe arise this kind of integration, uh, integration, uh, integration. So, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe I can compare some difference by choosing some. Yeah, for example, I can introduce n to the yeah. <laughs> describe uh, uh, other spectral density, and depending on n, maybe I can uh, draw some other figures. And but uh, I, I'm guessing mm -hmm. this kind of. Uh, dumping mm -hmm. feature is kind of universal. Yeah, that is what I wanna say, I wanna say. Thank you very much. Any other, ah, oh, okay, Carlo? Yeah. Hey, Shantaro. Hi. Just a very, very nice question. Again, on your continuous spectrum. Uh, am I right uh, from, the, from the picture? Is there a mass gap? Like the continuous spectrum comes from a mass ah, yeah, gap? Yeah, or? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't explain, but uh, M0 is the static point kind of. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, there's a mass gap. The, yeah, yeah, I the see. gap, uh, how to say, the continuous spectrum starting from this one. So I okay. perform integration from this body to the infinity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Adriana. Questions from our group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why do you need the gap and how small can it be? Ah, uh, maybe, yeah, actually f for the cosmological collider problem, what, what uh, the situation we are interested in, the mass is a bit higher than the Hubble scale. If the mass is smaller than the Hubble scale, of course, it depends on the intermediate particle. <clears throat> in this case, we don't get the oscillation uh, signature. It's a kind of scaling uh, signature. So mostly what I, uh, when I say cosmological collider, the mass uh, is a bit larger than the Hubble scale. That is a situation I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh, Professor Hume Lee. So you, so you have oscillator features in the non Gaussian field. Yes. The oscillator is in, in the ratio of the momentum, right? Yeah, all right. So for large scale, there are also. Yeah. Limit. Yeah, squeeze limit. In, in practice, how do you distinguish between two limits at the same point in your case? I think it's possible to use in your notes. In, in practice, there are uh, very few schools to think of one and kind of curate first. Do you think? Yeah, K equal one, the, this approx approximation is really bad mm -hmm. because uh, I get the uh, analytical expression in the kind of squeeze the limit. So maybe 100 or 10, maybe it, it will be correct. But uh, around this region, it's- uh, um, yeah, this region, you can make the two measurements. You need to make the two measurements for different um, case. Can you distinguish? I don't know. Uh, yeah, you mean, for example, so this point- have to know the mass, mass but uh, I don't know. You need to have many data for it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe we need uh, many, how to say? Yeah, correlation for the, uh, the space, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So then in practice, uh, you, you need to take a prime with the different 
change? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe. Uh, yeah, but uh, in my situation, I only get the, the expression in the squeeze limit. So yeah, actually, yeah, recently, yeah, in the kind of a boot, bootstrapping uh, program, the people try to exactly get the fully analytic, analytical expression, not, not uh, restricted in, in the squeeze limit, but any kind of momentum configuration. So I don't know what happened in this case, but if we could apply this method to uh, this kind of situation, maybe I can get the uh, fully, how to say, full, I can extract the full momentum dependence. Yeah, maybe exactly. I can just do it. Uh, yeah, thank you. So we are kind of behind the schedule. Uh, we have to go for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Let's thank Shintaro again. So next speaker is Pan Dr. Pankaji Saha from Seoul National University of Science and Technology. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. 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 So first, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Introduce. Yeah. She introduced me. Right. The talk today. The talk title is Primordial Cosmic Complexity and Effect of Repeating. Please have yeah. Pankaji. Okay. So first of all, thanks the organizers and thanks specifically for uh, taking care of the vegetarian people. Okay. So, yeah. So I'll be talking about primordial complex, cosmic complexity and the effects of the repeating phase. And uh, so as we know that the quantum information theory is currently the boiling pot for melting pot for many different branches of, uh, of physics. So I'll be specifically studying this complexity at, from the primordial universe and the see the effects of reheating. So all the details and derivations that I, I'll miss in this talk if you uh, want, you can you can see this paper with Professor Min Hun Park. Okay, so let me begin. So as we know that in the we or our universe is uh, is started from quantum vacuum fluctuations that get, get stressed to classical uh, seed for structure formation. That uh, that so in that sense the universe itself is a free lunch. Okay, so. This classicalization process is studied in the realm of squeezing formalism. So I will briefly describe this squeezing formalism, mainly the nomenclature of different terms. Then I will describe the reheating constraint nomenclature model. Now Shintaro has very nicely described many different aspects of the observational aspect of uh, inflationary cosmology, the inflationary phase. Oh, yeah, okay. But the reheating phase is not much constrained. The reason is because the reheating happens at much smaller scale. And another problem is that the thermalization. So thermalization erases more, much of the information how the uh, components come into thermalization. So in that sense, reheating is uh, constraining reheating from inflation is challenging, but there are some indirect way to, to constrain the inflationary or the reheating phase. Now, I will combine this constraint on reheating phase and the squeezing formalism and, and to define the complexity and how, see how the cosmology or our, our universe uh, determines the evolution of this complexity measures. Okay. So 
inflation, everybody knows about inflation nowadays. I mean, it's, it's pretty standard stuff. It's a phase in the early reverse when the universe expanded quasi exponentially. The vacuum fluctuations in the, in, in, uh, the quantum fluctuation and, uh, amplified by the expansion became classical C, uh, C, C for the classical structure. Now the reheating phase is the phase follows inflation. So now if we want to characterize different epochs in the early universe, so the one quantity that we need to know about is the equation of state during each epoch. So if we know that equation of state of dominant energy component of the different epochs, that is even the nomenclature is even like radiation dominated, matter dominated. So if for inflation, we need equation of state less than minus one third. So after an inflation ends, equation of state for a brief, brief period of time is determined by the inflationary potential. So if, if your inflationary potential is five to the power P, the equation of state for this uh, coherent oscillatory period will be P minus two by P plus two. After the uh, end of this coherent oscillation, uh, the reheating equation of state is not known. Then we must have radiation dominated epoch. Like the big bang evolution is actually start from this period and, and goes up to like present time, then matter domination and currently dark energy domination. So now by reheating, I will just see the, uh, the effect of reheating. I will measure by this in, in this macroscopic way, like what is the equation of state? We will see that what is the equation of state? What is the duration of reheating? And what is the effect of this, 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 this macroscopic effect of the, this phase in, into, into, into our complex heating measures. Okay. So the motivation is like this. Now, let me just give you the deep uh, description of squeezing. So squeezing is basically very well known in, in quantum optics. So when a phase space volume moves, uh, moves in such, such a way that one direction gets it get uh, one direction grows and uh, uh, another direction get uh, shrinks like the uh, normal way we say squeezing it is similar no fancy thing is here now people uh, albrecht Freida, joyce and Kokobek, these people have applied the squeezing formalism to cosmological uh, the inflationary perturbations in 1994 in their response to to the paper by by Yushchuk and, uh, and Shudono, I think, yeah. So who said that this squeezing formalism cannot be applied to inflationary perturbation. So basically this, this squeezing is determined by the squeezing uh, op operator and the rotation operator. So this is the squeezing operator. These are some phase. And you can write, write the time evolution operator as a product of these two approaches. Okay, now what we need is uh, what we are squeezing actually. So Shuntar has mentioned about the um, uh, curvature perturbation. I'm just, let me reiterate the things again. So we have, uh, sorry. So we have fluctuation in the, uh, the, in the field of in the inflaton and we have fl fluctuation in the matrix. Of course, we, we assume that the anisotropic states, et cetera, all the standard Appro uh, appro uh, assumptions are there that there is no anisotropic stress. So we combine those uh, fluctuations into some gauge invariant combination known as the curvature perturbation. Then eventually we want our equations to be harmonic oscillator, like resemble the harmonic oscillator. So we write them, uh, scale them to what is known as the Mukhanov society variable. We quantize this quantity, okay? Now this, because this is real, so th so this uh, naturally like the Fourier modes are not independent. So this naturally uh, uh, divide the system into bipartite system. So each K and minus K are uh, entangled. So this is the system we will study our complex thing. Okay. So basically we can derive the equation of motion for this. We can solve them uh, analytically in some cases. And in most, in, in all other cases, if there is no analytic solution, then we can solve them numerically, having our analytic approximation solution as guidelines. And we start with some specific initials, 
condition such that my mode function is, is start from bunch Devi directory. Okay, so now we have like we have this equation of motions. We will solve them, and then we will define some complexity measures from this equation of uh, this this quantity, like the squeezing parameter and the squeezing angle. So let me give you what is the if we solve them what what is the behavior of this uh, the squeezing parameter. So the the squeezing parameter R K grows when the mode exit the horizon. So this is horizon exit. This is horizon re-entry from different equation of state. This, this phase parameters, they grows outside horizon, but their, their sum remains constant throughout. And, uh, and of course, if you have different equation of state, then there will be different, if, if only if holds when they will re-enter the horizon and then after re-enter, they will, they will settle to a, a, a constant value. Okay, so this, now let me define the actual complexities that I will define from this uh, squeezing parameters. So first is the OTOC. So why we need this? We know that the, in, in, uh, when we define chaos in a classical system, uh, by Lipunov coefficient, we can uh, we we define it, it, it via this uh, Poisson bracket. Okay. Now, an analog in, in in quantum system is the unequal time commutator, but because this is a C number, we define what is this double unequal time com commutator or the out of time order uh, correlator or OTOC. Now, for our case, uh, this this like we will. Eventually, after doing some steps uh, in, in, in this commutator, etc., we will see that this can be written in terms of the squeezing parameters like R k, theta, and phi. Okay, so this is one one quantity. We know all the things R k, theta, and phi. We can solve them for our perturbations, and we can define the OTOC. Next is the quantum viscosity. Now, if if this 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 fancy name is not familiar to you, the related name is the uh, von Neumann entanglement entropy. Now, for for our state, now if you if you divide a pure state into two subsystems, then it, it then it, it 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 can be shown that the von Neumann entropy and the quantum viscosity are identical. So we will calculate the von Neumann entanglement entropy, which is the quantum viscosity, and quantum viscosity has some merit over von Neumann entropy. But since since our case they are identical, so I mean, we have no problem, what, whatever way. Okay, so derivation is not important. The important thing is that how, I mean, after do, doing this, like we, we can uh, write the von Neumann entangled in property again with, with our squeezing parameter. So we now have everything, the, every formal thing yeah, at our hand, we have squeezing parameters that we can write OTOC and von Neumann entanglement in property in terms of the squeezing parameters, okay? So now we, we need to describe the, our background system. So for background system, we, we take this M square phi square model. Now, if, uh, before you ask me why this M square phi square model, because it's already been ruled out, I will say that this model choice is not important in this case, because we are only seeing what is the background evolution is there. And because of M square phi square, you can write this analytic expression so that your numerical uh, uh, solutions are, uh, when you will solving the differential equation, it is easier to solve uh, with this analytic approximation. But if you want to choose any different model, you have to do everything numerically, but that's not a problem. Now, so the, to find this Hubble parameter, you, you need two, two things, like what is the equation of state during reheating and what is the epoch of reheating. Now to find out what is the, uh, Epoch of reheating, you, you do this reheating constraint, which was developed by Dai et al. In, in, in a very nice technique. So, so you can write NRE, the reheating, duration of reheating, in terms of the parameters. Everything is known from observ observations, except this uh, efolding number during uh, in, inflationary folding number and the scalar to tensor ratio. But what they show in, in this paper that you can find everything in terms of the spectral index. Now, if you think the spectral index as your observational quantity, you can know every, every other 
quantities, uh, even the reading, if folding number and etc. So let me describe this thing with the picture. So what I want to want to tell you in this or stress in this picture is that once you know the spectral index during reheating, you know what is the e folding number of in inflation e folding number. Also, you know what is the reheating e folding number with some beginners in the equation of state, but you know what kind of equation of state you have, like whether it is less than one third, greater than one third, or if it is zero, like if your folding is leading folding is zero, you can think it is like radiation dominated. So you, you know what kind of equation of state, although there is a degeneracy between this type of like between one third or less than one third, greater than one third or one third. Okay. Now, how this, this thing, if you take care of this, this consistently, how this uh, classifies your modes, different modes re-enter. So let me zoom into this, this bottom picture. Okay. So if you take care of this reading folding number consistently, you will see that modes, if the modes enter in, in radiation dominated epoch, then whatever the reading reading folding during it is not it doesn't matter so only the reading the the reentry will be determined by whether your equation of state is less than one third greater than one third or one third in between any value if less than one third it doesn't matter all the reentry will be same for all the equation of state so this out of infinite possibilities now if you take care of this reading constraint you now only have only three, three classes. So this, this fact or this observation will help us in, in, in seeing the this, uh, observables. So let me give you the result straight away. So one is this, the modes when they re-enter during reading, then you see the equation of state, each equation of state has uh, different signatures like, uh, one is radiation like that is always always distinct, but it is, if it is zero and 0.25 because this has one sim single class because this is less than one third, so they have different signatures like the final value. But if your modes re-enter during radi radiation dominated epoch, so now I will I, I will uh, in the next slide I will give you a number. So all the modes I could have plotted other equation of state, all the modes will be have, will have the same amplitude. So all, all the equation of state less than one third will have same amplitude. Radiation will, let, will be like same amplitude and, and, and greater, uh, le, greater than one third will be same amplitude. So let me just, if this is not even clear, let me give you the summary plot. So that, that is the main thing, main message is this, this reheating, constraint if you take care of them then properly your equation of state can be any value between zero to one but now we have only three classes one third greater than one third and, and less than one third and now because we want to know a value value because so what is the value like so if you take some benchmark point it will be like all the modes uh, all the values smaller than this so because this is k, so your length will be inverse of this. So like CMB has minus 10 to the power of five, 10 to the power of minus one megaparsec. So all the large scale modes, even, even, uh, even much uh, smaller scale modes. So practically all the modes of interest will be classified into this three, three categories. Okay, so yeah, so that's all for this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pankaji. Any now it open to questions and comment. Any question or comment? Ah, okay, Fonsi. Okay, 
So uh, the perturbation modes, when they grow, then they cross the Hubble horizon during inflation. Mm -hmm. Then after inflation, mm -hmm. then they again uh, the, the, will re-enter the horizon. That's what I meant by the uh, re-entry of the modes. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, mean, I mean, if you see this, this picture, uh, this picture. So this is the co-moving Hubble horizon, which, which dec uh, decreased during inflation. And in all other standard evolution, this co-moving Hubble horizon always grows. So this mode exit some, uh, this co-moving mode exit at some point and then re-enters in some point. So like this mode exit at this point and this will re-enter at, at this point, like this. Thank you very much. I think uh, we ran out the uh, time. So let's thank Pankaji again. So Ligon, could you please share the screen? Ligon, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, hi. So can you share the screen? Ah, or well, Professor Humili has, ah, sorry. So, can you share the screen? Uh, uh, could you with one with, with for several minutes because I need to open the. I need to set my my computer. I find I I cannot uh, use it directly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, I'm still uh, setting. Uh, I'm still setting my computer. I, 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 maybe you can uh, ask some others to to give a talk. Uh, and then I, I, after I, I, I'm okay. I, I, I will give a talk. Okay. You're the last one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, you are last. Yeah, okay. 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 You need to have your talk over dinner. You need to go for dinner. I, can, I cannot. Maybe I, I, can, I can switch another computer. One, one minute, okay? Yeah, one minute is okay. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry.
Is it okay? Yes. Thank, yeah. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, content stream is predicted in many beyond many uh grand unification fields, grand unification series, and uh, low scale field transition may be uh, predicted predicted in some QCD field transition or dark field transitions. Electrical field transition is well motivated for electrical biogenesis for uh, two as planned. Uh, Final symmetry of our universe and the high scale phase transition uh, are also predicted in some beyond sign model physics. They can this kind of uh, stochastic grid wave sources can be predict can be probed uh, by uh, quasar time array or uh, the the space interferometers such as LISA or uh, LIGO. Here is the uh, here is how can we connect. Uh, the uh, green wave with uh, particle physics. First, from the particle physics uh, models, we first we can calculate these field transition parameters uh, with uh, through the thermal field theory calculations. For example, field transition duration beta and also field transition strength alpha and the bubble wall dy bubble dynamics, the wall velocity v v vw. Here, uh, after we calculated this uh, t parameters, we can perform lattice simulations. So that we can get the Gerson wave power spectrum. After we got, got, get the Gerson wave power spectrum, we can consider the, uh, consider the di different configurations of different uh, uh, detectors, for example, LISA. And then we can, to, we can, dis to, to, uh, pro we can probe this kind of uh, Gerson wave Current wave sources, and through this kind of method, we can pro probe, uh, probe particle physics. In fact, it's uh, uh, after many many years development, it's uh, especially the latest uh, simulation, uh, development of latest simulation, 
we we now have this kind of power, power spectrum, uh, green wave power spectrum of of the phase transition. The first one is the uh, bubble collisions. It's uh, <clears throat> usually it's considered this kind of contribution is smaller than sound wave. Here it's the sound sound wave, but 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 here we 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 need to keep keep in mind that it's only uh, limited to some thermal phase transition. For example, some super cool, cooling cases, we may uh, uh, these bubble collisions may be uh, much larger. And uh, this one, MHD turbulence is much smaller than some others. See, talk to oh, David. For the uh, simulations, we have, uh, indeed, we have uh, performed a different one. Here, we consider the uh, gauge field on the on the lattice, we consider the uh, the the uh, the SU two gauge boson and the U one gauge boson. We put this field on the lattice and perform the lattice lattice simulation. Here we first uh, calculate calculate the phase transition parameters through some field theory, and then we we input these uh, these parameters into the lattice and then perform uh the lattice simulation, we can find that the bubble nucleation and expansion and uh, uh, population. During these places, uh, we have the we have the uh, we have we have the contribution uh, from the uh, bubbles and also maybe maybe the sound waves. But here in this uh, in this work, we didn't consider sound wave. Here with this. Uh, uh, contributions from bubble dynamics, we can uh, perform uh, perform the uh, let perform the latest simulation and get the uh, green wave spectrum here, and then we can uh, to we can we can match with different uh, kind of particle physics models to see if this kind of the different kind of particle physics particle particle physics models can be proved with uh, future. Current 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 web detectors. Of course, there are many studies with the uh, different different kind of particle physics models. Here we maybe we cannot uh, cannot to see can to see which one is the is the right one. Uh, even we find the find a typical current web spectrum because we we need to, because we here we only. Uh, know the semi broken process, the 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 uh, the the uh, the results from the semi broken process. I mean the phase transition uh, dynamics from current waves. We can we can find we can find maybe uh, the potential at this time. But uh, if we want to exact uh, uh exact form of the potential, we need also to know the uh, the potential at the zero temperature. This time, this case is is up is what we can get after the symmetry uh, broke down. Here we can probe the cubic cubic coupling uh, through the Higgs pair Higgs pair production processes. Now I will talk about some some uh, recent uh, some uh, experiments. I mean real data. Uh, because uh, we, we don't know when we can get data from Lisa. The first one is from the LIGO. Here they perform they performed the uh, uh, the search of first of transition at uh, in the uh, data O three of, of LIGO like LIGO or Virgo. In this case, they didn't find the uh, didn't find the Signal of the stochastic uh, gluten waves, but they can with this this uh, data to constrain the phase transition at a pretty high temperature. For example, uh, 10, uh, 10 to eight uh, GeV scale, and also they can constrain the the inverse duration of phase transition to be uh, 10, 10, 10 to two or ten to three. Uh, for the low school field transitions, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, models, for example, dark sector or QCD scale field transitions, these kind of models can be 
can be proved through the uh, past time memory. In fact, uh, with the PBTA DR2 data set, we didn't find a stochastic green web. Uh, at least, uh, we didn't find a strong evidence of the stochastic green web background. And then we use the, the, the data to constrain the, the first hour phase transition. Here, we constrain the low scale phase transition. We find that uh, this, this kind of parameters can be excluded at uh, uh, 95%. Uh, percent. Here, this, uh, uh, this, this is the temperature of the phase transition. So you can see that it's about the uh, MEV, uh, MEV steel. And uh, the, uh, uh, the phase transition duration is about 10 or 10 to uh, 100. May, maybe uh, can be much, can be excluded much better. Here we are talking about, uh, in fact, we didn't consider the, the detect the, the more exact uh, uh, step of the phase transition or, or mode of the phase transition. In fact, there are many, uh, there are many models motivate the two-step phase transitions, electrical phase transition. For example, the electrical bandages to explain the final symmetry of our universe, and also the dark matter, especially the wimp dark matter or film dark matter. Here we can one consider, uh, in fact, this uh, both motivate the strong first order electrical phase, electrical phase transition. So that we can accommodate the final symmetry of dark matter uh, Simultaneously, uh, for example, this uh, real thinking model or, or complex thinking model or composite, composite models. In this, in, uh, in these papers, they consider the, uh, the, the simulation of the uh, two step phase transition and uh, realized uh, some ben benchmark models. In fact, we we uh, we are considering uh, in on the uh, on the uh, we are considering the realization uh, on on lattice. Uh, in fact, we are considering the, the turning to turning processes with the uh, with the, this kind of model. Here is phi and h. Phi uh, here is a Dino scalar. H is the same model uh, Higgs with the high temperature as benching. We can have this kind of uh, thermal field, uh, uh, thermal potential. But here, we, we can say, see, that, see, see that we only keep the uh, T-square term. In fact, it's because the other terms are not uh, not very important for our cases, because we are, we are considering the jump of the, uh, of the jump, uh, the vacuum jump from this place to this place, which is the, it's the distortion of the D2 symmetry and the broken of the uh, electric symmetry. It's motivated for dark matter and electrical bandages. Uh, sorry, because uh, something wrong with my computer, I, I cannot see the movie. Oh, yeah. That's okay, because uh, you see the, uh, the cool movie uh, provided by David. Here it's, we, we, in fact, we consider the profile of both the H and the phi. This is the profile of H, this is the profile of phi as the initial condition of as this kind of uh, bump profile is uh, calculated through the bounce solution of the action uh, at a finite temperature. During simulation, we can find that the H approach to the uh, broken phase and the phi approach to the symmetry distortion phase. Symmetry phase, Z2 symmetry, Z2 sim it's the distortion of the Z2 symmetry. And here we get the uh, Gerson wave. Here it's from the uh, bubble clay, this corresponds to the collision of these uh, different, uh, these bubbles. And this LW, this place is corresponds to the um, the uh, scale oscillation uh, dynamics and uh, also it's uh, it's highly connected with the the bubble thickness. Oh, oh, yeah. 
<clears throat> this kind of models have been probed to to be probed, and maybe maybe these kind of models can be probed at a uh, uh, IRC or CPC in the future. This kind of you can see some uh, studies of uh, Professor Lento Wang and uh, Andrew Long. Is in these papers, and also maybe uh, this kind of uh, uh, models can be probed uh, through offshore Higgs at LHC. You can see, find the paper of Tao Han. Another case is the is about uh, the dynamic that about the detailed uh, mechanics and mechanism of the phase transition. Here we consider the delayed vacuum decay. Maybe it means in some places we have the vacuum decay, but in some places we have we we have the postponed in some postponed hubble volume, we have the undiluted false vacuum energy. Yeah, so that in these cases we have a chance to uh, for hubble volume not decay until some time Tn, and then we can have the uh, formation of uh, uh, PBH here is the uh, primordial black hole. Here we have the creation of the Hubble horizon. And then you can see that uh, outside and the inside, the, the places, maybe we have different uh, the, uh, density of, uh, of the uh, volume. Here it's, it's called one to the uh, force vacuum decay. Uh, we we need to keep in mind that we, in fact we are considering the uh, pretty slow uh, phase transition processes, and especially if the if we are considering the hubble size vacuum decay is put one in your hubble uh hubble size hubble size horizon this place, and then we have the we have the uh capture perturbation here we are we are carried with the first uh. Uh, so, so, so for from lesson here the causality requires the PR uh, proportional to k uh, k to three <clears throat> k the uh, proportional k <clears throat> three this this, this uh, uh it's a relation with the uh, uh, wave in fact wave number. Here we can find we can, well, through our calculation we find that the uh, the hubble size uh, perturbation is uh, proportional to uh, beta ray to uh, to uh, to uh, minus uh, five over two this uh, <clears throat> this kind of power is either hub scale so that we connect we connect this uh, this. Uh, uh, perturbation with the phase transition strength and the phase transition duration. And then uh, we can constrain this kind of uh, phase transitions through the capture perturbation. And in fact, we can we consider the, the CMB spectral distortion and also the uh, after compact uh, massive hole, may, 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 may not, may not hole, the, this is from plaza timing and this is from the gamma ray here. We also present the constraints from the uh, PPTA. Here it's in fact it's from our previous paper, the PPTA constraints on the, on the first order phase transition. It's a, it's a this this counter, and uh, another one is this one. Uh, it's the constraints from BBN here and here, and it means that uh, we can we can uh, constrain the low scale and the slow phase transitions. Uh, with the uh, capture perturbation. Here it's uh, uh, this kind of phase transition are motivated for the dark phase transition or electric phase transition. Uh, it means it's uh, under the, it's below the 100 GeV. Okay, thank you all. Thank you very much, Li Gong. Now it's open to questions and comments. Any question or comment? Or any question or comment in Zoom? Ah. 
and maybe it's too late. <laughs> it's the dinner time. <laughs> Riley Gomez, David Weir here. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so the simulation, the, your PLL, which you talked about at the start, uh, was that um, that's magnetic fields and a scalar field, or what were you doing there? Do you mean here? Yeah. Yeah. We can do the, the, the scalar field and also the gauge field. The gauge field. Uh, I, the scalar field is on the side, and the gauge field is as as the, the gauge link. But we put on the lattice, different uh, different sides uh, di uh, to connect different sides. Okay, right. Thanks. Yes. Do you see that you're looking at uh, the formation of thermology magnetic fields there? Right. That was your, that's what you found. In fact, we recently while while we are trying to connect. To compare uh, the results of this method and all, and the uh, uh, method method performed by uh, by a group, for example, your by uh, uh, compare the with the method uh, considering the fluid. Okay, yeah, no, I, it's interesting, yeah, because uh, I think the effective number of degrees of freedom in a magnetic field is is many fewer than there are in the standard model, so. Uh, I think the results you get are a bit different, but they they look really interesting as well. So yeah, thanks for clearing clearing that up. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question or comment? So, if no, let's thank Professor Bigon Bigon again. Okay, and I stop. <laughs> thank you very much, Bigon. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, all of the 